Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Future in Review podcast. I'm Barrett Anderson, the COO of Future in Review. For those of you who have never heard of Future in Review before, we run the annual FIRE conference, which The Economist has called the best technology conference in the world. And we have just this last week announced to our audience that we are going to be back in person uh, for FIRE 2023, November 6th through 9th in Los Angeles, California at the Terranea Resort. It is gorgeous, and we're going to have some of the smartest people we know there. So we hope you will join us. Um, The other arm of our business is Strategic News Service, which provides our subscribers with the most accurate source of information about the future of technology and the global economy. And I am here today with Mark Anderson, who is not only the founder of Strategic News Service, but uh, a regular contributor, the, the primary regular contributor. Um, And we're going to be talking about his most recent global report, uh, which is focused on entering the era of hyper change. So, Mark, can you tell us a little bit more about what what do you mean by that? What is hyper change? You know, Barrett, I think there is a an increasing sentiment worldwide among some thought leaders that we might be better off without that dang Internet. Uh, or iPhones, or make a list, you know, but that the pace of change that has been introduced by these enabling technologies has exceeded uh, the ability of society, let's say, Mm -hmm. subgroups of society to effectively engage. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, those who are evil doers, who want a pretty funny word, um, take advantage of this in misinformation campaigns, divisive uh, postings on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's not hard to make the case, at least for some subclass of either people or people with a certain maturity in terms of information, uh, that um, this is damaging and it's out of their, not just their control, but their ability to deal, you know, to cope. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, those, those people who are a little bit more elitist probably feel like not me, but them. Although I increasingly, I suspect it's everyone. everyone, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all turns of us. Out, it turns out no, none of us have really evolved to cope Don't with get a pass. the level of communication and connectivity that we are experiencing today. Yeah. And there are a lot of interesting sub questions that can come out of that. Um, how often should you rev a product every two weeks? That's too fast. Every two years, that's too slow. But, but this is something that product managers in tech have wrestled with for years now. Once they had the ability to rev every five minutes, mm-hmm. that's the right answer because people don't want to rev every five minutes. Yeah. Our forced updates for Microsoft are not much appreciated, or if at all. So um, a lot of problems that are uh, on both sides of the tech fence, whether you're the buyer or the vendor, whether you're the citizen or the, you know, the propagandist, whatever you are, this is a really different age. And this age of hyper change isn't necessarily 100% beneficial. Well, so in, you talked, you wrote, you wrote a lot in this week's report about AI specifically, and can I'm wondering if you can um, explain why it is that you focused on, you know, open AI, GPT, and chat GPT as an example of this hyper change. Well, we're seeing this in real life right now, and from the tech perspective, but it's affecting everybody. It'll affect artists in San Diego. It, it's going to affect everybody. So, it is affecting artists in San Diego. It is already. So, so imagine that it's November of last year. That's only weeks ago. Mm-hmm. That is a few weeks ago, just before Christmas. And um, well, this months, new thing yeah. is put out, you know, this chat GPT. So mm-hmm. GPT is a term that people don't need to understand. Uh, it stands for generative, pre-trained transformers. It's a technology that came out of Google, of all places. Uh, it went through a company called OpenAI that was started by Elon as a nonprofit. Um, it's not a nonprofit now. And, <laughs> Isn't it funny how that works? <laughs> yeah, that was really weird, actually. And he quit. He quit it. That, that's its own. That that should be a separate issue of SNS. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We should. Uh, yeah, that would be very interesting. Coming up, maybe that'll be part two. <laughs> and and then uh, uh, it, it turns out that it's good at two things. What really matters to most people would be it create. It's good at content creation. Right. But define good carefully because it's not really. It's very adept at at content creation, meaning it's a good copier 
Mm -hmm. Reminds me of China. They're good copiers, you know. So this technology is made for one thing only. Reach more broadly into the net, into the context of a sentence or the context of a work of art, of an image, and understand it. No, I shouldn't use that word. Broaden your horizons as a technology a little, a little more, a little further down that sentence, a little larger into the paragraph than before. And by doing that, create a greater sense of context, not understanding, but context when you try to write a sentence as a human being would or create an image as a human being would. That's it. It's a copycat. Right. Better copycat than before. That's all. That's it. So, however, <laughs> even though that's, oh, and, and of course, therefore, it is uh, heir to all the foibles, fails, and screw-ups that we all have on the net. So if, as an example, Fox News gets aggressive and runs a, a 24 by 7 story saying something untrue, heaven forbid they would do that, they're now being charged in court for it, then um, this would become part of the context that the chatbot would pick up. And re-report back. And re-report back as though it were true. That's back. Yeah. Without having any ability itself, because that's just not part of the deal, not part of the tech, to, to tell the difference between true and false. What's fascinating in, part, in terms of the hyper-change part of this, to me, and I think to a lot of people, is that we had just had a nuclear winter in terms of investment in AI. Went on for about a year, and it was spurred by all the usual things. Putin's misadventures in, in Ukraine, uh, rising inflation rates caused by the banks, but now will be cured by the banks, and then you know all that stuff around it. So everyone kind of terrified. Uh, the Fed wants to destroy the markets, just like Alan Greenspan did, in order to do their job, which is not their job, and we all suffer because they have to create a recession, et cetera. And so we're going through all that with no investment happening, really. The VCs are paring down their ownership, cutting off companies at the knees, and then refunding or reinvesting in companies, which are their core success stories. It was a mess. It was a drought, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly. I mean. What? What? Are you, are you here to tell us that's no longer the case? That is no longer the case. Suddenly there's funding for AI. Suddenly. At GPT. Yes. This not miraculous, but very interesting new technology, which is quite good at seeming to be human. Um appears and the spigots are opened and billions and billions, maybe tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars are going to be poured into this and have been poured over the course of weeks. Right. The result that those on this side of the line of AI called GPT are getting funding beyond their wildest dreams. And those over here are still you know sucking wind. And and the and the problem there are two problems that are obvious. One is it's a sheep it's a typical VC sheep story in hyperchange time. Mm -hmm. So it never, it never ceases to amaze me how much of the innovation in the world is driven by a group of people who have very little vision of their own and act like lemmings, essentially, to create yeah. products that people may or may not need. Well, that's why they fight over who's going to be the lead on this investment, because they don't want to all do the due diligence, just one, yeah. one person, one smart kid or one, I don't know who, somebody. Are you in? I'm in. Are you in? I'm in. I'm in. Are you in? I'm in. That's how it works. So they're all in right now. And um, as an example of the huge increase, not only in funding, but in valuations, suddenly, in weeks, we have this company, which was a not-for-profit, founded by Elon, for one reason, to help humanity, I think. And then, now it's a for-profit. Now he's fed up with it. Now he quits it. Now Microsoft put in one billion, now another billion. They did, that's not on the record quite yet. And now they're gonna put in 10 more billion. That's not quite on the record yet. We all know what's happening. That would make 12 billion in essentially, uh, well, the first one was in 27, 2019. The last one was just a few weeks ago. So I don't know, 11 billion in the last few weeks with the resulting change in valuation from whatever it was, because you can't find it on pitch book. That's kind of weird, to 29.2 billion. Wow. Hmm. For a technology, I'll say it again, which in the words of Gary Marcus, probably the smartest guy around on AI, is bullshit. Absolute bullshit. So exciting. 
exciting times and yet kind of not great you know and and uh, back to the artists in san diego i mean there are a lot of people who are in the arts or who are writers and so forth who do a real job of trying to edit or report or find truth and report it or say it or paint it or whatever it is probably be out of a job pretty soon because chat gpt will replace them right you know, be free it's weird so here we are, here we go with something that was almost the antithesis of what Elon had in mind, if I understood it properly, where he wanted to create a powerful thing, not a wrong thing, and then give it to the right people early so they would prevail and, and have guardrails. And instead, he's out of the picture. We've got a corporation that's going to own the whole thing, kind of. And I like Microsoft, but you know, that's a different destiny. So that's so you, talked about, you, you, hyper, talked, you talked about Microsoft putting investing 12 billion. Yeah. Uh, what role does Google have to play in all this? Oh, that's the best part. It's Google's tech. Microsoft and Google, no secret, are abject enemies, pretty much. And here we go. Google's tech, when it was a nonprofit, was put into open AI, pretty interesting. Which part it of it? It becomes a four, pro well, GPT, hmm. the, whole, the whole deal. Okay. And then now I think it's gonna be controlled by Microsoft. I th people will argue with me, but that's what I think. So it's basically a takeover move by Microsoft to gain control of Google's yeah. AI. It's like, thank you, Google. Interesting, that's, yeah. pretty, that's pretty interesting. Now, Google already has GPT, so it's right. not like they don't have it. Yeah. I don't think they meant to really give it away, improve it, and then give it to Microsoft privately. Yeah. Yeah, but that happened. So here, here we are. And this does question this mean remains, that we're not, does this mean that, that like the serious business world that uses Outlook and for security reasons, it doesn't, isn't going to have to write their emails anymore? Because that I would actually support. That would actually be a useful application of this technology. Are you being skeptical or cynical? No, I'm being serious, actually. All right. Uh, well, let's see. I mean, what um, what uh, Sacha has said, Nadell has said about this, uh, when he made his announcement of his most recent investment was, well, while he was firing 10,000 people, actually, mm -hmm. was. Um, well, he doesn't need them anymore now that he, he's investing in chat GPT. It's a small part of the workforce. <laughs> it's, it's a rounding error for him. It's not a big piece. Yeah. But um he said, you know, we're out now we're uh, the AI company. And and in further comments, kind of like AI will be part of every product. It reminded me of when multimedia first came out and, and President Mike Maples then of Microsoft said multimedia isn't a division, it's a part of every product. So that's that's where they're going. And who isn't? Right? Mm -hmm. But now we're back to this hyperscale question again, you know. I mean, really, how fast and who will be in charge and who will decide what? And is it true or is it false? How do you even protect your customers if you don't know yourself if it's true or false? And, you know, maybe Gary's right. Maybe it's all bullshit. But it's very, very fast bullshit. And since it's powerful and mm -hmm. fast, I guess the, the question I was trying to raise is, is hyperchange always good for us or is it even essentially good for us? Well, so so what is what is I mean, unfortunately, whether or not you think it's good for us, it's happening, right? Yep, yep. And so so the question is like, is there what is the what is what's the alternative? What do we do instead? How do we as well, a society get smarter about and build protections in to save us from our own stupidity? Well, let's go back to Rupert Murdoch for a minute. My least favorite person, I think, at least in the news world. So here's a guy who didn't care at all about what was true. He made a billions and billions of dollars off of Fox and off of newspapers printing things, which are probably not true. And, and a whole empire in the media based on turning um, what was a news idea into a theater or, or a shouting or an anger idea. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it worked for money but it destroyed, essentially destroyed the world of journalism, as far as I can tell, before we even saw the advent of this of the deleterious effects that came from social media, stealing all the ad money, like Google stealing right. all the ad money from others. 
paying so paying all the a, media companies to put their content exclusively on Facebook and then cutting them off from all their subscribers. Yeah. All that. So, you know, from one perspective or another, we've lost even a value. I'm going to say something political, which I never do. The Republicans, darn them, have, had, particularly under Trump, who once was president, which is pretty amazing, uh, have, have um, somehow demonetized or legitimized the idea of truth and of science. Now, I never thought that I'd see that happen in my lifetime, but they have. They did it intentionally for, for reasons of power. And so mm -hmm. it kind of began with Fox and then spread out throughout the entire or half the GOP or something, maybe all of it. So here we are in this now, this age where does true and false matter to them? No. They're up to, I want to hear QAnon, right? That's all. About, so it's, it's so badly off the tracks. Those of us who remain actually interested in science and experiments that can be repeated twice in a row, you know, you drop the ball from the Tower of Pisa and it falls the same speed twice. It's an incredible thing. Um, that's the world we live in. Uh, so how does this play out? Is it true that truth doesn't matter anymore if people say it enough? I don't know. But the VC dollars would say yes. Right now, this month, they would say Yes, it's unimportant. It's relevant to us, to them. Uh, try as they might to make excuses about why it's okay to put tens or hundreds of billions of dollars into this technology, which clearly creates falsehood. So the answer would, to your question would be, what's the opposite of that? Mm -hmm. Well, the opposite of that would be telling the truth. Knowingly. How do you do that? Well, there are ideas afoot um, I'll just say it because this is my disclosure bias. I'm running a company called Pattern Computer where we happen to do explainable AI. It's the holy grail of all AI, by the way. It's not like just us saying this. And if you had it, you'd use it. Those guys don't have it, so they're not using it, but it's important. And what it means is it's explainable. It's transparent. There's no black box problem. You can see through everything that's happening. You know how it did what it did. And therefore, you can see what's true and what's false. That's the technical answer. But, but even that, answer. even that would require so much time. <laughs> you know, the average person is not going to do that. No, no, it shouldn't be the problem for the average person. And so, and so, therefore, you you have the same. You can you can use, you know, explainable AI to make business decisions and to improve your business decisions. But for the average person, you're going to have the same issue. It doesn't well, fix the information issue. It's going to be a matter of the corporations and the governments, not the individuals. But imagine you had, as an example, a choice of which car to buy. And here, I'm going to pick on my friend Elon, but I, he doesn't deserve it. He's far ahead from everybody else with autonomous driving. I've been told by people who are experts in that world, you cannot have safe autonomous driving or flying without explainability. In other words, you have to know why the car crashed or didn't mm -hmm. crash. Um, so if you had a choice, I mean, car A is a new Ford you know, Mustang Mach-E or whatever, and it's got it, it got explainability. And the other one, because there's somebody else doesn't have it, and you're gonna put your family into one of those two cars. There you are at the Hilton front door, and you're putting him into a car to go to Chicago Hare Airport. Which car did you pick? The one with explainability. And you know that because they advertise that they use it. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be corporations or even governments that say, you're going to have to have this, like the GDPR requires this in Europe, they can't enforce right. it. If, 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 if you're being dealt with by AI, you have the right to know why, why it did what it did to you. You have a legal right. So, okay, fine. And, you know, governments and, and corporations, I think, will have to be the leaders on this. We shall see. You shall see. This is, this is, it's a daunting, it's a daunting thought, really, to think about what does that look like moving forward? Um, it's daunting, partly because it's catching on so fast to be a liar. If lying is going to be the deal, or telling untruths are going to be part of the deal, how fast can we stand up the telling the truth part? Well, strategic news service will always tell you the truth, and it will never be written by chat GPT. <laughs> no. Chat GPT has a hard time extrapolating 
uh, across multiple ecosystems and actors and identifying that level of analysis still. Yeah, yeah. That may not always be true, but- No, that'll be trivial compared to knowing what's true and false. Yeah. Well, so that's the problem. And I hope for all of our sakes that we find some way of coping with an era of hyper change where society is served better than we're serving society today. And if you'd like to join in that plight with a community of like-minded uh, readers and, and thinkers, you can join Strategic News Service at the link below this video. Yes. Uh, you can also join us at Future in Review. Our tickets are not live on the website yet, but they will be in the coming months. So in the meantime, you can sign up to stay in the loop about when we get those up and ready to go. And we will send you an email as soon as they're live. Futureinreview.com. Futureinreview.com. Yep. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you, Barrett. Bye-bye.